Hi everybody, I'm Fran Spielman and with me is the head of the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, the latest iteration of police reform in Chicago. We've had so many. Sydney Roberts, thank you for joining us. Certainly. Chief thank Administrator. You for me. Good morning. When I look at your resume, it's like you came out of central casting <laughs> for this job. Director of the Illinois State Police, commander of the Maywood Police Department, lieutenant in the Essex County prosecutor's office, you were a deputy attorney general for the state. So what did all that do to prepare you for this very difficult job? Yeah, um, actually, I think it gave me exactly what I needed for the job. Um, thinking about where I am now, there was something that was just moving me to be in this position. I didn't really know it. Um, you know, starting my career actually first um, working on behalf of offenders um, and helping low-risk offenders, you know, be released from prison through a faith-based community organization. That was my first uh, job in the criminal justice system. Um, but as I moved forward, when I got into law enforcement, you know, I spent the majority of my time doing internal affair investigations, actually uh, investigating officer-involved shootings. Um, came to Maywood. Uh, for a short time, I was at the Maywood Police Department, and then I had the opportunity to actually leave policing, and I spent 10 years serving as an Inspector General. So now I'm having the ability to continue to, in, to hone in on those internal investigative skills. Um, and uh, so when you think about the advocacy, the law enforcement experience, doing those internal investigations, I do believe it really prepared me to be exactly in the position that, that I'm in. But that's on a, pers uh, on a professional level. On a personal level, for me, um, I have a 24-year-old son that I, I worry about. Personally, in my background, I have experience being stopped because, in my opinion, I was black. Um, our family has been a victim of uh, police misconduct. Which one? Who? How? Where? My, my son. What happened? My son actually, um, he was stopped by a police officer in... Um, in Chicago? No, yeah. no, this was downstate, but um, there was evidence of a crime that was attributed to him that had no basis in which to attribute that to him. We had to file, a, we had to get an attorney, you know, ultimately all of the charges were dropped. But what were a, the charges? That was a very uh, difficult time period for us to have to go through that. What were the charges? Uh, they were minor um, uh, paraphernalia charges. Uh -huh. And he didn't do it? He didn't have no. it? No. Did he have anything in his possession at that time? No. No. I mean, so the point that I'm getting out here is that to this job, I bring a law enforcement experience, I bring public integrity experience, I certainly bring sound investigative experience. But you I bring, bring a mom's I bring worry. A mom's worry, I bring an aunt's worry, you know, and all of those things play into, you know, uh, identifying with the individuals that are making these, these And you comments. obviously, as a mom, had the conversation. Absolutely. With your son, and what, how did that go, and when did it happen, and what did you say? Yeah, you know, what I told my son is, listen, if you're ever pulled over by the police officers, you be respectful, sir, you show them your hands, you listen to them, you abide by what they say, you don't take the fight. Let us, let Handle me it. take the fight afterwards but the most important thing for you is for you to come home from that encounter and did he follow that advice that night oh absolutely and he was charged and you got him off the charges were dismissed dismissed okay and he was never jailed or anything like that he was held for a couple hours really yeah. wow yeah, I mean, did that change him you know i think he was very disappointed because i was a police officer at that time and mm. no matter what was he one of your colleagues no oh, no okay. it was, as i said it was southern illinois but no matter what um you know i grew up with my father who was a police officer i grew up admiring respecting and seeing the good in 
in police and believing that um, all police were reflective of my dad and his values. And you know, that's just not, not the case. There, there are bad apples everywhere. There are people that make mistakes. Um, and so the first time you see that, it's a little, it's a little, Jarring. yeah, it's a little eye-opening for me. So last night, the police board voted to fire these four police officers allegedly accused of covering up for Jason Van Dyke and the Laquan McDonald shooting. You didn't have anything to do with that because it was administrative. Mm -hmm. You deal with excessive force, police shootings, mm -hmm. intimidation, etc. But was that a good thing for your work? And what did you learn? What lessons for you at COPA are there from the Laquan McDonald episode, which is now pretty much over in terms of all the punishment? Sure, sure. Well, a lot to say about that question, so I'm going to try to get it all out. Um, the first thing that I do want to say is actually that is something that we do investigate. If an officer has, um, if we believe an officer has lied or exaggerated um, the facts known to him in relation to um, another officer's uh, conduct, in relation to um, a citizen's conduct, we have the authority to investigate those types of incidents. Those are called Rule 14s. Those oh, the Rule 14s. But you yeah. didn't get involved in but these four. we did four. not get involved in these four. Why not? And so um, when the Laquan McDonald incident happened, because there was so much criticism um, of the former IPRA organization, anything administratively to deal with Laquan McDonald was referred to the Inspector General's office. Oh, just I see. To, it was just taken out of your hands because taken, nobody trusted it. Got just it. Just taken out of the hands. So, so what's the larger lesson for COPA going to me, the forward? The larger lesson is that we have to continue to ask the right questions when we are doing these interviews, when we are seeing misconduct or we're seeing and we're receiving information that is just not jiving with the facts. We have to drill down and ask and say, okay, explain that again. How did that happen? How did this happen? You know, it was one of the things that were brought out in the Department of Justice report was that uh, there were like cliffhangers that were left that were not followed up on. That's the lesson is to keep making sure that we are doing thorough investigations. We are leaving no stone unturned. And if it doesn't make sense, then we have a duty to try to make it make sense. The other, to me, the other thing that came out of the Laquan McDonald is all of the reforms that have come about. I mean, when you look at COPA today, the, 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 the impetus for the Laquan McDonald was the lack of release of that video. Today, that would never happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only does the city say these videos have to be released in 60 days, but we are releasing those videos as soon as we absolutely can, as soon as we have all the key and critical information so that no one we interview can use that video as, okay, I'm gonna watch this over and over and over again, and now I'm gonna get my store together. We make sure that we talk to the family and we have a conversation with the family and we bring the family in if they want to see that video, to see that video before it's given out to, to the world. Our community engagement, the way in which we touch the community. I mean, so many things have changed um, in a good way. It is, it is- what, Your budget. Our, our budget. I mean, you know, one of the, the uh, you know, OPS, part of the police department, okay. Formerly run by Lori Lightfoot. Yes, at one absolutely. Point. Then in 2017, we have a bar fight in, um, involving some Chicago police officers, and they said, wait a minute, you gotta take OPS or the civilian oversight body out of the police department. And so the reporting was to the mayor's office. And then following Laquan, what you've done is created leadership stability. I can now reach a decision that might be adverse to the city without worrying about being terminated. I don't have to worry about being underfunded or understaffed. Um, so, so many of the, the um, deficits of the former iterations have actually been corrected by this new ordinance, 
But you know, we're we're still reforming. We still have more work. You well, know, you do. you've got openings too. You have 141 positions. How many people do you have? Right now, we have about 126, 127. And why do you have so many openings? I'm going through the hiring process. Um, right now, at the end of this year, we anticipate being able to hire um, and be fully staffed. With it. we have a budgeted headcount of about 151. Um, so we are going through that process. We've brought on about 10 so far. Um, we have about 10 investigators we're hiring, hiring major case specialists, hiring attorneys. We've got some directors positioned. So we are still in the hiring phase, which is part of our reforming process to make sure that we have the people in place to do the jobs that we've got to do. Don't you need to streamline the hiring process? It takes so long, it? is a it? very, very arduous um, process. Um, and um, the Inspector General recently had some meetings with some of the agency heads, including us, to talk about ways in which the process can be streamlined. Um, it is certainly something that we're, we're very concerned in because it takes, you know, months. And you had a backlog. You yes. had a huge backlog of cases. What is the backlog now? Yeah. And how long does it take to complete an investigation? Sure. Because that was a huge sure. complaint sure, sure. as well. Sure. So uh, when COPA launched, there were almost a thousand IPRA cases. Presently today, we have completed over 85 percent of that IPRA backlog. Right now, of our IPRA legacy cases, it is 175 cases and we are on target to close if not all very close to almost all of those cases some of the reasons why they wouldn't be closed there could be pending civil litigation there could be pending criminal charges you know they might have little nuances that are making some of those close but we're we are moving full speed ahead um, How long does it take to wrap up an investigation now versus before? Sure. So looking at right now, um, our numbers are really, really skewed because some of these IPRA legacy cases are very, very old. So looking at just our closure rate for cases that have been open since COPA and closed since COPA, we're closing cases at about nine months. And that's Can't do it quicker? Not so far. I mean, we've got a lot of the the IPRA legacy cases that we're working on, and so that is our focus because those are the oldest cases, but we're making sure that we're doing enough work on the newer cases that are coming in so that we're not losing any evidence, we're not losing any witnesses, and we're taking care of the most egregious cases. So we are implementing processes. Um, we are uh, modifying our process. We are modifying um, our reporting forms. We are adding personnel resources. So I think this time next year, we'll be at a better chance to be a little bit more definitive because hopefully by the end of the year, come to 2020, we're just dealing with COPA cases, cases that we opened, that we have been working on along the way. But one of the things you had to work on, and you said so at your confirmation hearing, was to restore the public trust to the point that they would make a complaint to yep. you and feel that it was really going to be taken yep. seriously. How is that going? What does the complaint level look like? Yeah, I think we are making um, strides. We are making significant strides in that. What do the are, numbers show in terms of the complaints? Well, our complaints are going up. By how much? I actually don't have that percentage. Figure. Um, maybe this last quarter, I want to say about 25% between uh, quarter one and quarter two of this year. Of this year, um, and was it going up last year as well? Or what I can tell you is, if we continue the pace, if the next two quarters are consistent with the first two quarters, we will receive more complaints this year than we have received last year. But what I think is important that I also want to point out is last year, through our community engagement efforts, we had direct contact with 10,000 uh, members of the community. We spoke with every single recruit class. We are now speaking with every single promotional class. We are at the universities. We are at CPS. And you asked me, are we making progress? 
We have had calls to our public affairs staff or to our investigators that have gone out to the community to give these awareness. And our, our mantra is who we are, what we do, how we're doing it, and what you can expect from us. There was an officer involved shooting. We got a call, hey, I have a young lady that has some information, but she's uncomfortable coming forward to the police, but she'd like to talk to you. That didn't happen several years ago. I was at the gay pride parade, an officer standing by, she reaches out, says, hey, I remember you. I'm keeping myself clean. I remember what you said to us. We are having an impact. When we're leaving those recruit training classes, those officers, they're, they're actually saying, I didn't know that you had people that were former law enforcement officers. I didn't know that you had people that were former prosecutors. I didn't know that you provided your staff with training on how to do investigations, how to do interviews. I mean, we're displaying myths. Do we have a long way to go? Absolutely, absolutely. We are an entity as much in reform as the Chicago Police Department. We are reforming how this has happened. We are not where we were. We're not where we, we want to be. We're, but we're but we're getting there. You know, we're getting. But we, you know, we need some time. You know, we need some time. We got to get some consistency. We've got to get some traction. We've got to get some precedent. I mean. With There's the, been c criticism of your homicide investigators not being qualified. What are you doing about you, that? You know, it's just utterly unsupported by the facts. Our investigators that are assigned to officer-involved shootings, they have gone through investigative training. They have gone through state-mandated law enforcement homicide investigator training. We have now even extended that lead homicide investigator training to staff that is not assigned to major major crimes. We have sent investigators to uh, forensic pathology training. Our investigators have gone to the training for officer-involved shootings. I will put the training of my investigators against those investigators in the Chicago Police Department that are doing these any day, any day. They the are, union has been saying that, though. And, I, and, I and what is their motive for I that? I think it's an easy accusation. I think it's an easy accusation because they're not law enforcement. I think there is this... They don't have to be, is what you're they saying. They do not have to be. What is it better that they not be? I don't think they have to be. I personally do think it's better that they're not. And the reason is because today and for the years in the past and probably for the years in the near future, the community doesn't trust law enforcement to investigate themselves. So our investigators... Is that ever going to change? Probably not. I think we can make improvements, and I think it is one officer at a time making that improvement. And, and for me, and I say to those officers, and I say to personal friends, I say to people that I know in the business, it starts by treating people with common decency, treating people with humanity and respect. That is all most people in this world want even people that are doing bad things, you can still treat them with an element of respect. And are the police not doing that? I think there is a huge opportunity to improve the manner in which police officers initiate their first encounter with people on the street. Do I think that every single officer is disrespecting and demeaning and demoralizing every single individual? Absolutely not. In fact, I think the majority are likely treating people appropriately. But you're saying but there's, there's a surliness a and maybe an arrogance in the first encounter that, that sets the tone for? I would say that in that first encounter, what, what is generally, what is often the case is, you know, the officer just approached me with a level of disdain. The officer approached me like I was a criminal. The officer approached me without any sense of interest in who I am and what, you know, what I'm calling for. Why, you know, I'm actually the person that called. Um, it is not every single officer, but the complaints that come to us 
even when that is not the allegation, it, it there's is, a pattern there. Yeah. And you've talked about you wouldn't hesitate to recommend policy changes if you saw a pattern. Yes. So have you yes. recommended? What have you recommended? Yes, we are making policy changes. What? You know, so we, what recommendations have you made for policy changes? Sure. Uh, most recently, um, we made policy recommendations in the uh, relative to the engagement of transgender individuals, um, recommending that they reiterate the importance that they follow CPD's policy that says to address people by the pronoun in which they say they want to be addressed by, to ensure that they are housed in the appropriate cell that is appropriate for that individual or put in a cell by themselves, that they are not demeaned for the clothing that they wear. That was one that we recently put out. We recently put out another um, uh, advisory to, uh, to encourage them to adopt a policy that uh, initiates the officer bringing to the department's attention that they might be taking a lawful prescription medicine that could impede their judgment. Um, those are some of the things. Now, some others have been recently issued. I'm not at liberty to speak about them right now because the department has 60 days in which to respond and then we address those. But um, we address things like, um, uh, uh, yeah, it'd be best to not speak. Because right. I want, I, I, you know what I mean? I don't want to. Before we go, let's talk about the Inspector General's report. You had an employee. Yes. In improperly accessing 80 files yeah. on, on, on a boyfriend and her uh, and the boyfriend's family who are all police officers, doesn't that hurt your credibility? Oh my gosh, let me tell you, I was outraged personally. Um, our entire office was outraged. Um, How there, could that happen and what there, have you done to correct sure, it? Sure, if there was a shining light, it was actually an employee that brought it to our attention because that employee was outraged that that was going on. When we found out about that, we immediately cut off her access. We relocated the individual um, off of the investigative floor, took away any type of access, and immediately contacted the inspector general's office. What I want to also say- What have you say, done to fix it? Absolutely. What was in place was any person that comes to our office uh, and starts to work before they have any access to any records. They are uh, told about the prohibitions on computer usage. They sign a conflict of interest. They sign a confidentiality agreement. All investigators and attorneys go through COPA Academy where they actually elaborate on the integrity of compliance with that system. So this individual knew full well that they should not have done that. What we have done since then is we have taken all of our employees back through that training. We have put additional protections in the um, the ordinance. We've provided, I mean, in the policy where we've gotten more specific and said this is an example. This is an example. But the other thing that we've done is when you turn on our computer and you access our database, you have to click that you have no conflict with that particular case you are about to look at. And if another person goes to look at that case, they have to click that before anything on that file pops up, they have to click that they have no conflict. So, you know, our protections are in place. We have to make sure that, uh, and I do believe that we've provided sufficient deterrence against it in the outcome of this case. I think is indicative. And okay. since January 2016, COPA made four recommendations. The police board voted against you every time. Why is that happening? Is the, is the city presenting, as Sharon Fairley, your predecessor, said, mm -hmm. uh, because they have a conflict of interest, the law department, and they're looking out for the city's interest financially, mm -hmm. are they presenting weak cases to the police board? Yeah, you know, I can't. Uh, I am not in a position to say that the Department of Law is not mounting a vigorous prosecution. Um, I do uh, feel that, you know, to the outside, it can appear as though there is, in fact, a conflict. 
What I also know through my experience in doing internal affair investigations. Should there be like outside lawyers handling it instead of the law department? Um, that would certainly be something that I would be in favor of. Because? I do, I do see value. And again, not because there is a conflict, but because there looks it, 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 yeah, it, it, it looks like there. So I do see value um, in that. And that's, that's you would not, you would like to see that's, that. That's not a, a, a secret. I think that that is something where that is worth discussing. Um, I don't know, uh, and I'm not going to say that that is the only way that that happens. But I think it's worth a discussion about. Um, is this a legitimate appearance that we should be concerned about? And if we are And it is, you think. Why is it? I think it's I think it presents an opportunity for the public to say, hey, you just defended a case civilly and now you're coming back to prosecute the very same case before a different tribunal. It um, looks fishy. I, I mean, I, I, I think an argument can be made. I do not believe that it is, or I have no reason to believe that it is, in fact, a conflict. But, but it you know, sure some, looks like it. Yeah, I mean, and the, the, you know, one of the things that, that we say, going back to the question you asked earlier, you know, part of that pop-up, it is, is there an actual or perceived conflict. And, and both are that, troubling. And if that is the case, they are obligated to check that box. And once they check that box, then, you know, they're coming to me and now we're going to talk about it. Is it an actual? Is it perceived? And if it's perceived, is it to the extent that we should just eliminate it and all together, just get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not going to say that all perceived conflicts mean that you have to change course. And the same thing here in this process where the city is doing a little bit of both. I'm not yet at a point where I'm going to say all perceived are in fact problematic, but I think we need to have the conversation. Yeah. And I think it needs to be, as you talk, we talked about earlier, it needs to be that honest conversation. And that conversation is what is in the best interest you know, of the city, what is in the best interest of, of the community. Um, you know, there's, there's no, um, there's no wrong answer, but we want to make sure that we have the better approach. Um, and so we can, we, we need to talk about it. Sydney Roberts, thank you for joining us. Thank we could you, talk Fred. a long time about yes, police reform. Sure. I hope this is the last alphabet soup, sure. soup iteration of police reform so in Chicago. I think we're in the best chance for this to be the last uh, alphabet let's, soup. Let, let's hope so. <laughs> thank and you. we'll see you all next week.